Hello everybody, welcome to the Eternal Spoiler Breakdown. My name is Pojo, we are going to be talking about a lot of cards from Flame of Zolta. There is a new mechanic, Muster, which we will be getting to, uh, but we haven't done a spoiler breakdown in a little bit, so there's actually quite a few spoilers to get through, uh, starting I think all the way back from like Aramot. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into them. First things first, we do know that Spellcraft is back in Flame of Zolta, and Muster is going to be a big part of why Spellcraft is back in Flame of Zolta. So let's talk about Spellcraft. Uh, we have of Age Worn Vestige here, a relic weapon that has Spellcraft 3, play Harsh Rule. So pay an additional 3, get a Harsh Rule on top of your 6 cost 3 9 relic weapon. Now, 3 9 relic weapon is kind of interesting. Like, you can actually do some pretty wild stuff with that amount of health on a relic weapon. And at 6, like, that actually will clean up a decent amount of aggro and kind of get you into a better situation against some of the more aggressive stuff. It's definitely no, like, Auric Rune Hammer in terms of, like, overall just stats for power kind of efficiency that you might get, but if you're doing pretty well when you play Age Worn Vestige on 6, you're probably going to be continue to be doing well afterwards. And then playing 9 for the Harsh Rule, that's, uh, that's a whole different story. Like, paying 9 for a 3-9 Relic Weapon gives you 9 health, and it also kills everything on the board, except those things that have Aegis, which Age, which Age Worn Vestige probably picks up, but also, like, that is a lot to pay for a Harsh Rule type effect, and the card that you have after the Harsh Rule is over is is not so highly board influencing. I kind of think this card is actually maybe a little bit more useful as a relic weapon than it is as a uh, spellcraft casted nine drop, but certainly it's not a bad bonus for the card, and if you're playing the two together, you're probably stabilized to the point where you're actually going to win the game, even though this card does not have the push to win a game after the harsh rule. So. There's some notable issues with it, but it does do pretty well with War Cries. Basically, if you are playing a deck that has a high amount of War Cries, this card will come out swinging pretty hard, kills a lot of like the nasty mid-range drops, uh, doesn't ever get up to like Sandstorm Titan levels, but can be paired with Torches and paired with other types of removal to sort of help get rid of things. I think this card is a really unusual stat line, but it's a lot better than it seems in terms of its overall vanilla value and its Spellcraft value. Uh, that being said, that Spellcraft value is still a little bizarre. I'm not sure if like 9 is ever something that you're going to be wanting to go for, and if you're playing a 9 cost harsh rule, you probably should be playing other things as well that aren't 9 cost harsh rules. But hey, who knows? Uh, there are, There's some possibility that 9 is a place where you are feeling comfortable for a harsh rule and a little bit of health, so certainly wouldn't say no to it. All right, next up is Ancient Manual. We're going to be going mostly alphabetical here. And yep, we do have all the cards in different size images, because that always happens. All right, Ancient Manual is depleted. Gain influence and affection you don't already have. Uh, I would say that this is one of the weakest powers that has been printed. It is specifically really good in five-color decks, and it's questionably good in four-color decks. Like, if you're playing in a sizable amount of colors, and you can do, like, a wild amount of things with it, then, like, basically, like... Uh, if you're playing with like five different colors and you don't need to generate double influence in anything, then Ancient Manual is a card that is feasibly going to be okay, but it is always depleted, which is one pretty important thing to note about it, and it's also something that like generally doesn't give you like a lot of influence in factions that you like need to get influence in. If you need double influence in anything, you're going to have some problems. Uh, if you are playing like uh, like basically if you're playing like a lot of justice idols and then you just need splashes and all the other colors for some reason maybe ancient manual gets you somewhere but like there's a lot of reasons why ancient manual is not always going to provide you the necessary fixing that you want that being said, five color decks are potentially real sources of power, and even though Eternal tends to be pretty um, aggressive, I would say, with its influence costs, and often makes it so that most cards have a decent amount of influence and force you to go a little bit deeper into those influence costs, uh, if you're picking up enough good stuff out of enough different piles, this is definitely the five color card of your dreams. Um, but yeah, like overall, crests are just so powerful for fixing for these big hybrid decks. If you're already playing Crests for Depleted Power, uh, you're probably not going to move into much more than Tokens, and once you've done Tokens, then you start considering Ancient Manual, which at that point, I'm not sure that you're considering Ancient Manual at all. Still, 5-color, 
decks do want this. Like I would say that this is a card that really does sort of free up five colors and archetype, where previously that power fixing was just not available before. So this will add something to the current meta list, and I certainly don't think it's a bad card on that front. Uh, and if there is a five color good stuff deck that can actually use Ancient Manual, then this card could actually be broken and overpowered, which would be interesting because there's not a lot of knobs to uh, twist on that one. Okay, cheering section. This one's a four cost. Whenever a player discards one or more cards, play a zero one totemite. Once per turn, you may sacrifice any number of totemites to get plus one power for each. Yeah, little coin monsters. Uh, <laughs> I've seen some designs like this, and I think um, from like one of the uh, the magic. What were they called? The search for the great designer searches, uh, and it was actually a, a person who got into a uh, direwolf. But like, I don't think this is actually that design. Which, uh, nonetheless, it's kind of interesting. Like, we just basically have uh, uh, a little pile of power that you can slowly accumulate in the form of adorable little totems, and you can use this to potentially get quite a bit of power in a very short period of time, or to generate piles of small units that you can then use to power other sorts of interesting options. Uh, there's a couple of things that this card is doing that are not quite apparent, notably that like it is really, really good with mill, like basically any type of mill gives you a ton of totemites, which then allows you to power your void even further with just sacrificing all of those totemites to get extra power. So if you're trying to get a bunch of cards into your void for some reason. You need creatures in your void, you need some sort of like big powerful effect that actually cares about how many units are dying, if you're trying to tribute anything, if you're trying to trigger tribute specifically, cheering section does do some really interesting things there. Um, the overall like power aspect of it is not that useful, but I would say that it does do some interesting things and certainly makes something like red, yellow, purple a lot more interesting as a three color option. Uh, there's a lot to be said about what this card does but I think in order to see say for sure what it's going to be doing we're going to see need to see a few more cards i think there's a weird combo deck that comes out of this card i don't know what it is yet and i think that we haven't quite seen the other piece of it yet or perhaps the other piece is in a set one or two and we haven't actually seen it but uh, who knows either way that's an interesting one that certainly uh doesn't quite seem to have a high power level but if you are doing enough wibbly things it will reward you Cremate. Shadow, Shadow, Fire, Fire, kill a unit or sight, it gets void bound. This is a pretty dang good removal. Uh, it's on the level of Slay, especially since it is a fast spell and it actually targets both units and sights. So similar to a Death Strike along those lines, but it also kills the unit for good. This is a really, really good way to solve any problem that you want in a deck that doesn't care too much about being pretty slow with its removal. Like, this is pretty wild. You do get to destroy any sight, which is definitely definitely a reasonable way to get rid of some value out of your opponent's deck. Like if they are trying to set up a big sort of finisher, that's something that's really worth dealing with. Um, obviously you do lose value killing a site with this because uh, you will not stop the spell from being played, but you can still get the site very, very quickly, and that is better than most control decks can really sort of uh, say. I like that this card is in fire. I like that I like it when control decks are in fire in general because fire is just such an interesting control element. It's got a lot more direct damage, a lot more ways to end the game, and like if you're playing like control in fire, you're not going to be dirtling around quite as much, so you're probably going to be able to follow up on the kind of like interesting control stuff that you're doing where you're drawing a bunch of these cards. Um, this is pretty wild. I think it's definitely quite powerful, although the cost of it may become restrictive in Stonescar in particular, seeing as this is also where you want to play Bandit Queens, Champion of Chaos, uh, all of your like really aggressive stuff probably isn't going to want to force cost removal spells since we are playing things like Combust and Madness and Annihilate and all of that kind of stuff. So you really have to be playing Stonescar Control to get into Cremate, and that's recently been pretty hardly hard nerfed by Statuary Maiden's Loss, so you're going to need a couple more interesting options to sort of activate that. That being said, there's a huge Nightmare Dragons theme in the upcoming set. Uh, there's going to be a lot of big scary dragons, and Cremate fits really, really well into a deck with a lot of those big scary dragons because it's pretty okay with being slow on that front. So yeah, could be pretty interesting. I think this card's quite decent and should fit pretty well into probably at least one tier one deck. Den of Ordeals. All right. This one is six red, blue, purple. At the start of your turn, 
Create and draw a treasure trove for each different name among your dragons on a four health site. The vial, mullet, and Nakova's agenda, although it's kind of interesting that that is the wording because uh, the, the card itself is called Nakova and Malot, and it does not have vial on it. It's possible that this will change around, or maybe there's something going on where, like, yeah, it's a little hard to say exactly what's going on here, but uh, yeah, there is a new mullet Nakova, or a Nakova and Malot, that will be in Den of Ordeals, and we're going to take a quick look at that as well, but first things first, the uh, overall agenda, Talon Dive, plus two, plus two, and flying to a dragon. Streets of Flame, 3 damage to any enemy and scout, and the end is near. Discard all of the power off the top of your deck. I think the top 10 power. That's interesting. So Den of Ordeals is creating something that draws lots of treasure troves and does it only when you are flush with dragons. So it's pretty hard to be flush with dragons because most dragons cost at least four, and so you're not very likely to have more than one or two down with Den of Ordeals ever. Like I would say one dragon is probably good enough to actually be in a position that you're already starting to win the game. So this card is pretty weak on face value for that passive ability. And then the agenda is also one of the weaker things that we've seen on a site. We have Talon Dive, which is only good if you have the dragon. Dragon. Streets of Flame, which is okay removal, but doesn't really defend Den of Ordeals as well as you would like. And End is Near, which is actively bad for really aggressive dragon deck or for really controlling dragon decks that have like six or more stuff. End is Near is the type of card that you play when you don't ever want to draw any more power. So like the top 10 power of your deck getting tossed means that you then need some way to actually play that power and you then need some way to capitalize on the fact that you've played a spell off of a site that doesn't actually give you any additional value. That being said, uh, I would prefer End is Near on a site to End is Near in a deck, so that's certainly something to note about it. Uh, the Streets of Flame is fine for getting a little bit more scouting going and getting you into your other stuff, and the Dragon at the top of Den of Ordeals, if you can keep Den of Ordeals alive, is actually quite powerful. So let's take a quick look at Nakova and Malot. Uh, and that one's going to take a little bit of a second to find. And of course, it is enormous. But Nakova and Malot, 10 costs, similar to Malot and Nakova. Red, red, blue, blue, purple, purple. Can't be played uh, through normal means. It does not have a gem, so it only comes out of this site. And it is an 8-8 with Flying, Aegis, and Berserk. And Summon, deal 4 damage to each enemy. This can't be blocked by Aegis. Enemies killed this turn get void bound. So uh, kills a bunch of stuff, void binds it forever, allows you to spend more removal to kill even more stuff, which if you're playing this off of a site, you will have more removal up. You can actually do your cremates and your other nonsense to get rid of the bigger stuff and just completely lock everything into the void for a permanent effect. The card has Aegis, same as, Nikova and Mal as Mullet and Nikova. It has Flying, same as Mullet and Nikova. And it has Berserk, which is a nice little bonus that I would say is fairly meaningless if this card comes out, but does allow you to at least get one extra turn on the clock, assuming your opponent can't kill Nakova and Malat, uh, the turn that it comes out, because that Aegis ability does protect it pretty well, and then the Berserk ability means that it's dealing 16 damage in the air, which is usually enough to close out the game after your opponent has already taken four. So wild amount of stuff happening here. Obviously, there's a lot going on with this pair of brothers and sisters, but like also this card is pretty expensive to get out, takes a lot of work to get to, and the onboard impact is strong. In fact, it's ridiculously strong, but I really don't know if you're going to see Nakova and Malad all that much. So I'm not sold on this site yet. I think it's one of the weaker sites. Uh, it is really, really interesting, and if there are good enough ways to defend it, uh, it will be a pretty premium control element, and it's also a more interesting control element than I think a lot of the control decks that have been built lately, where we've seen a lot of, like, Spetch of Sanctum, playing just blank tokens, Martyr's Chains, playing, like, big old nonsense garbage. Like, basically, like, there's not a lot happening that, like, is as interesting as what Nakova and Malad are doing. And there's a lot of interesting interaction going on there. So this is a really interesting control setup. Uh, dragons drawing more cards, playing more dragons, getting into some wild amounts of mid-range. Uh, nightmare dragons in general kind of support this pretty well, and we've got a lot of interesting nightmare dragons. So yeah, hopefully we'll see some cool stuff out of this. I'm really looking forward to seeing someone build something cool with this card. Uh, I'm just not sure that it's playable yet, but it's possible that it'll actually get 
to the point where it becomes a preeminent control or mid-range deck, and that can be really, really wild. All right, Elaw's Martial Scholar. This guy's a six cost, three five, endurance unblockable. Summon, set each other unit's strength to three, and mastery nine, play a card of your choice from the enemy player's deck. So six cost, uh, when you play it down, it immediately prevents, puts everything else to the point where Elaws can block it and take it down, although not necessarily kill it. So Elaws can block anything, then can attack without any fear of taking damage, has endurance, so can always prevent at least one of those units from attacking in, and then also uh, takes only three hits to steal cards from the enemy player's deck and play them, which uh, if you are picking any card out of your opponent's deck, that's probably worth it and fairly likely to win you the game. If you get that Mastery 9, you have almost certainly won. Uh, and the summon ability has, I think, enough onboard impact that it should actually be pretty reasonable to play. I'd say this is a pretty strong six drop card. It should play pretty well in Argentport Control. And there's a lot of interesting Argentport Control archetypes already getting set up that should be pretty interesting. It is also a Paladin, as people are pointing out, so you can give it Bond with uh, the um, oh, the, the one three anointer of the faithful, and you can do some other things to sort of like help out some other options with paladins. So, yeah, like it's pretty decent. It's a good boon to like that weird even paladin stack, which is not amazingly strong at the moment. And we, it's also pretty good for a bunch of other interesting paladin archetypes and interesting Argent Port control archetypes. I think this is pretty interesting. It does leave a lot of stuff on the board, so it's not always going to be 100% correct, but. It's pretty good for playing straight into uh, Arch Import stuff, and that's definitely worth noting. Aramont, Death Incarnate. 5 8 unblockable. When an enemy unit hits you, kill it. When an Aramont attacks, the enemy player discards the top 10 cards of their deck. So lots of health, can't be blocked, and mills your opponent for a pile of damage while also discouraging people from attacking you. I would say this card is not that great on face value. For 7, it doesn't have any sort of onboard impact. Uh, the enemy unit hitting you to kill it is kind of important, but like if you spend a removal to kill Aramont of any kind, you're probably okay. The main problem is how are you going to remove it if you are in fire? I think you're pretty much just in some trouble there and also that's going to punish you for being fire pretty badly but Aramod is not as likely to be the big blocker he's more likely to just sort of sit back and let you attack into him so maybe you can find some ways to burn through that and be okay that is a really sizable health value, and that is the one thing that I think maybe makes Aramont worth it. Uh, but yeah, the attack ability, discarding the top 10 cards of your deck, gives him a nice little clock, but also he can kill your opponent faster than that clock, so it's not a particularly important thing unless you're also playing additional mill, which I still don't recommend. Like, uh, mill in Eternal is pretty bad, and also, like, not a terrible lot of fun to play most of the time, so yeah, this is, like, eh, mediocre, but really, really interesting and fun, so there's some cool stuff that you can definitely do with it. Uh, we are... Uh, overall mildly interested in this one it is probably not going to be like the legendary of choice to craft in shadow when it comes out or anything like that <clears throat> warbrush oni all right more big stuff so this one is a 2-1 with summon and when you summon it you get to add a plus one strength to every unit in your hand and this is just way too big okay cool each unit and weapon in your hand gets plus one strength uh, on summon. So I actually think that's a reasonable summon ability. I saw some people who were pretty down on this card, but, and like the stat line on it in particular is kind of weak, but if you are playing a decent amount of aggressive stuff, if you're playing relic weapons and you want to do like basically something that actually transitions you into a good armory build, uh, like that extra strength on relic weapons in particular is really, really nuts. If you're playing with the, um, the new setup muster, that's going to be important because cheap weapons and spells are going to be something that you're really really interested in and also this card can support a lot of interesting weapon strategies and other ways that you can really really beef things up and do some pretty wild things um overall like the card is not going to be it's very specific like you need a very particular type of deck to get that kind of aggression out and it's a deck that needs probably at least 30 to 40 units and weapons uh in the deck 
completely and probably wouldn't mind playing no spells at all. But if you do get that going, Warbrush Oni is a pretty reasonable rally effect that can actually get you some wild amounts of extra damage into your hand that you can then use later on to sort of crush the game in the middle to late uh, setup. And I think that's something that's actually pretty worth looking at as far as getting some interesting aggression going. Oni aggression is always a little weirder than some of like the straight gunslinger aggression that we see. Um, they're always a little bit harder to build, but I think sometimes they are pretty rewarding and worth it, and this is a potential card that can help that strategy out. So continuing to build on that interesting uh, sort of Rakano setup. This one just got spoiled. It's called Tidal Forces. Uh, it, is a, oop, it is a relic, uh, four cost, cursed, and at the start of your turn, if the cursed player has two or more cards in their hand, you play a 4-4 Living Wave with charge and sacrifice it at the end of turn. Living Wave does not have Overwhelm, so it's not quite in Furnace levels of damage, but it does trigger almost as frequently as, say, a Flame Stoker, while also being pretty hard for your opponent to deal with, like, in the same way that Flame Stoker is. You are just getting a lot of consistent damage out of this card, and then, like, if your opponent manages to sort of basically play out all of their stuff, then and they're going to get into a situation where they don't really care as much about title forces, but it still matters for curse matters stuff and anything that cares about curses or has some sort of synergy with curses. So this is one of those reasonable curses that we might have been looking at for the unseen, like, Felm type archetype. I think it's a much more interesting take on the uh, Flamestoker archetype, and I also like that it's in blue. I think that this is a pretty interesting idea where you are getting both like that sort of curse element and also like a sort of aggressive tribal element and like sort of combining them together, which fits blue's flavor pretty well uh, in Eternal, where it, it's supposed to be just a little bit different from that of Magic. Sometimes uh, Eternal cards miss that mark a little bit, and this is something that actually kind of captures that pretty well. It's really interesting. I wouldn't say that it's going to be a tier one card because it's pretty easy to play around it, but it's a draft staple bomb, and there's also just a wild amount of things that you can do with it to punish like control decks and potentially play it with other set setups of curses and do some pretty wild things with it. Um, but yeah, like overall, this one looks like it's probably like a tier three deck uh, at best. Um, okay. We're going to go into the muster cards last. So let's do Hexcaster. Uh, that is going to be whoop, whoop, three cost two, two. When you play a curse, draw a justice siddle from your deck. I don't love this one. Um, like, it is a mage, not an unseen, which is notable because a lot of the curse stuff is unseen and has some synergy there. So if you wanted to go into blue-green unseen, that would be nice. Uh, but then, like, and there are even green unseen, but for some reason this one's a mage, so no tribal benefits there. It's got a 2-2 stat line, which is worse than Spire Chaplain, which also gives you a lot of justice sigils for basically just being out on the board for a period of time. Um, and probably gets you one more justice sigil than Hexcaster will most of the time. I think that, like, like actually getting a curse out on top of Hexcaster is pretty tricky, um, and obviously you're not going to be playing Hexcaster and then playing all of your curses at once because drawing a bunch of Justice Sigils is useful, but it's also the thing that you want to do early in the game. I think this card just doesn't have the stats to live long enough for the curses to be valuable. Uh, the extra cards out of it are great, and if this card actually does live, it gives you pretty consistent value and gives you some interesting, like, setups, but yeah, this is very specific, specifically something that allows you to play Curses in Draft and get some benefits from it. Even there, it's pretty easy to remove. Uh, I think it is something that you should remove if your opponent puts it down, but like, yeah, it's not doing an amazing amount of tempo work, and I think that the stat line on it is just a little too weak to really get any value. This should probably be a 3-3 if you want it to do anything wild. Okay, uh, Sacred Seal. This one's kind of fun. <laughs> Single power, no influence, you gain one health. Uh, so if you would like to gain a lot of health out of your power uh, and trigger a lot of life force triggers, this is something that you can definitely do that with. Um, it's fine. Um, there's nothing major going on with this that really helps you out. Like It is pretty monocolor or dual color specific, and in those situations, it's a little hard to take this over like Seal of Devotion, Chairman's Contract. Like, those two cards both have pretty powerful effects, but if you do need, if you are capable of playing like a monocolor deck with a lot of interesting benefits and actually playing the Sacred Seal, yeah, you could definitely do this. This is uh, not bad, but like, it's not like amazing either. I'd say that if you're like building the specific Life Force deck that wants it, 
do it, but most of the time you don't want to include this in your deck. And obviously you don't want to include, include this in your deck if you are playing deep into two colors or hard into three colors, both of which are probably going to be very likely strategies for the upcoming set. So yeah, this one's interesting, but it mostly only cares about Xenon Life Force and Time Life Force, and I don't know that either of those decks are going to be super popular in Zolta. Um, <laughs> Smoke Dancer. 2-2, two, two, Dragon Ally, plus 2, plus 2. Not bad. Uh, does mean that allies are back in the current set, which is nice. Uh, it's a cool sort of uh, tribal effect and does do some interesting things. It's nice to have dragon setups in general, and like anything that has some benefit with dragons is nice. This is also a cultist, and there's some cool cultist synergies happening as well. So you can do cultists and dragons. Cultists into nightmare dragons appears to be the preeminent stone scar deck, and that's a really different and weird flavor for Flame of Zulta that kind of moves away from the current stone scar gunslinger aggression. So yeah, I'm super into that. Uh, I like this card a lot. I think it's actually decently powerful. Uh, but like it obviously does take a little while to get to that dragon ally so unless you're playing a dragon on three and that's the real question I guess is are we going to see some dragons on three because there's maybe one and that's about it at the moment and if there are more then smoke dancer becomes a lot more interesting but it's pretty hard to get a dragon ally that early so we'll see what happens and whether or not this card actually does something good uh, we have the living wave uh, you can see the art for that just real quick it's kind of neat it's a big old strong one. And then finally, that's that's from the uh, Cursed Relic card. <coughs> and doesn't play on its own. Vile Collaborator, more cultists that buff dragons. 2-2, two, two, your dragons have plus one, plus one in lifesteal. Again, a three cost 2-2 two, two is a lot. But this one, it has a little bit more immediate onboard impact. If you're playing a bunch of dragons, you got the dragons down. Your opponent is like going under you for some reason. You just play Vile Collaborator, attack in, get a bunch of life. Your opponent has to kill Vile Collaborator instead of one of your dragons. That's not bad. This is definitely a reasonable draft card if you're playing draft dragons, which I think is probably going to be a possible archetype. And the stat line for it means that it's probably not going to be played much else in other places. But yeah, you could potentially see it in something that's going to be uh, reasonably well played. I would say mid-range, tier 2 lists, but not going to get much higher than that. Um, okay, and then finally that leaves our muster cards. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. Oh, and we're going to do this slightly differently because we always do this part wrong. Okay. <clears throat> So Muster is a new ability. Hey, Akko. Let's change your rat. Muster is a new ability that specifically says you get a thing if you do a thing. And let's talk about what the things are as soon as I find this card. <laughs> okay. Ah. Aha. All right. So when you play both a weapon and a spell in a single turn, that is considered a muster. And you can then muster to do something to the unit that has muster once per turn. So unlike an ultimate effect or other types of effects like mastery, this actually will trigger repeatedly every single time that you can manage to play both a spell and an attachment in a single game. That includes curses, that includes fast spells. So spells, fast spells, curses, relic weapons, and weapons. Uh, divided you know, two and three. If you can play a spell that generates a weapon, like Call to Arms, that will trigger muster. If you can play a weapon that generates a spell, like anything with spellcraft, that generates a muster. Uh, and just essentially mustering your troops uh, by prepping them for battle allows you to get some extra bonuses on certain cards. So, for example, on Wanderlust Kirin, the card probably worth playing to get muster is the um, spellcraft weapon that we saw previously that has Equivocate on it for four. You play Wanderlust Kirin out early, you equivocate your opponent's stuff away, and then you draw a card and do some wild things with that. Or you play the Wanderlust Kirin, you play the Equivocate card, which I believe costs two, and then you like Levitate or something along those lines to get another plus one, plus one. You got a big old damaging unit that has some interesting card draw attached to it. Wanderlust Kirin is a good example of how Muster can work, but I would say that it's not one of the strongest examples. This one is 
pretty interesting just for its unique unit type and unique style. Uh, Flame of Zolta is really coming out with some pretty interesting things, and we haven't seen a lot of the Elysian side yet, but clearly Kirins are going to be part of it, and uh, maybe might actually see a couple more of these. Uh, it's an interesting new creature type or unit type, and like overall that's something worth looking at, but yeah, this card looks a little bit underwhelming to me, even if you can get the muster going. I think there's going to be plenty of easy ways to get Muster going um, in both this set and in sets to come, but also there's just a couple of them to trigger uh, in the current one, like mostly through use of spellcraft. And of course cheap spells and weapons if you want to get really really aggressive could be pretty interesting. Um, there's some good potential there and could definitely do some interesting things with it. Uh, as a better example of what kind of stuff you would like to muster, we have Green Stretch Empath. This card is a 3-5 with muster draw two cards. It is a druid instead of a shaman, which I thought was pretty interesting since druid and shaman are pretty similar unit types, so you would think that they would be somewhat consolidated, but once again sort of giving Zolta a different feel and a different flair. Um, so with this one, you play a spell and an attachment, you immediately draw a new card. So that gives you a similar type of effect to something like Oni Quartermaster, where you are playing cards to get more cards, but also get a lot of extra benefits on the battlefield and do some like useful stuff there. With Green Stretch Empath, you can play down weapons and then remove targets from your opponent's deck. Like you can do something like Ice Bolt into some sort of uh, <laughs> Ice Bow into Ice Bolt or something along those lines, and then get extra cards to play with and have a little bit more fun. I think this card probably has a lot of fun in draft. And you can do some pretty wild things with it as long as you have the cards to support it. Um, because you are always getting your value back with Green Stretch Empath, this card is reasonably strong, particularly in draft. But I would say that the stat line on it, not amazing for uh, tier 1 deck or anything along those lines. All right, the final muster card is a little bit more reasonable and is actually quite powerful. And that is Nash, once more, Unrelenting. <clears throat> So Nash, Unrelenting, 3 cost, 4-4, four, four. Muster, Nash gets plus 3, plus 3 this turn. Now it is only once per turn, so you can't trigger this multiple times to get like a 10-10 or anything along those lines. Your other units are invulnerable to damage this turn, very similar to the original Nash, the 4 cost, 4-4, four, four, that didn't quite do the same thing. Um, so this one is an interesting card for a couple of reasons. One, it appears to be entirely Zoltan, and it's not clear if Nash has always been a Zoltan character or if we are now seeing a Zoltan shift of this card. Uh, we saw from Regent's Fist, which was a right fist, not a left fist, incidentally, that there may be uh, sort of dimension shifted versions of cards in Zolta, and this one appears to be the first of that line. I think it is a different Nash than the one that we have in uh, our current setting of Myria. And so that's uh, something interesting to note because like you do get some pretty wild stuff with uh, that kind of setup in terms of lore. Um, and potentially we could see some shifted scions, which could be really, really wild. Um, but yeah, Muster gets us a 7-7. Seven, seven. All of your other units are in vulnerable damage this turn. And notably, this is on another 3 cost 4-4 four, four in time, which means that we have a Praxis setup where you can have at least three three cost four fours in time and fire and do some pretty wild stuff with them in the meantime because you are playing cards like champion of impulse nash unrelenting and the new one um the battle master or the the arena showman something like that the three cost four four in fire fire time time so Tons of good aggressive three drops, lots of stats on time cards in general, and an interesting warrior sub theme that could actually be pretty interesting. That invulnerability damage ability is pretty fun. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it with uh, the previous Nash, but that one was a lot more unreliable. This is something that you can trigger every time, and if you do trigger it off of some kind of spellcraft, uh, it's a really rough day. Like basically, like Nash into a spellcraft weapon such as say slow would would just give Nash a 5-5 five, five endurance on turn four. Like that is something that really does kind of mess with your opponent's ability to react to you, particularly if you're surrounded by sand warriors and teachers of humility and a bunch of other hot nonsense. So this card is clearly pretty strong for a legendary. I think you can do some pretty wild things with it and I think it actually will see very competitive play uh, in the future. So wild, wild, fun stuff. 
Uh, it would be cool to hear a story about Nash because we don't know anything about either Nash, uh, the Mirian or the Zoltan Nash. And perhaps this is actually just one Nash or perhaps it is two Nashes. Uh, but either way, like this card is pretty interesting. And we're also seeing some things like this Zoltan sun in the background, which uh, I believe the whole idea is that the sun is dying and there's a lot of like interesting things happening as a result of that. Uh, but yeah, cool art, cool card, really, really interesting effect very very powerful and making me excited for the upcoming set so uh we're gonna go over more spoilers shortly but that is that is definitely enough for tonight um and we will be back when there are more of those thank you guys so much for watching and uh yeah cheers to all you youtube folks bye everyone thanks so much